So we are continuing with our lecture on the medullary anatomy and function. So the middle includes these three um, small bones that we call as ossicles, namely the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The malleus is attached uh, to the tympanic membrane on the lateral wall of the middle ear cavity, while the stapes is attached to the to the oval window on the side of the inner ear, and the incus um, kind of is attaches the malleus to the stapes. And all these three bones are um, kind of dangling within the middle ear space uh, by and attached to the different walls by five ligaments. And these ligaments do such an incredible job such that the movement of these this chain of ossicles is almost with negligible inertia. In other words, no energy is lost as the ossicles are being displaced or are moved by the tympanic membrane. The malleus is the largest of the three ossicles. It has a head, uh, a neck, and it's got three processes, the largest of which is the manubrium, uh, and then it has a anterior and a lateral, anterior and a lateral process. The lateral uh, tip, the end of the manubrium, is what's attached to the tympanic membrane at the point that we call as the umbo, kind of retracting it, the tympanic membrane inwards, giving it its conical shape. The incus consists, uh, it's, it's kind of a triangular shaped uh, bone with a long process. Um, so that's the triangular shaped part of its, its, its body. And then it's got two crura. Um, and the end of the long crura has this lenticular process. And it, it's that point of the incus that articulates with the uh, with the, the stapes. The stapes, the smallest bone in our human body, consists of a head, uh, a neck, and it's got two crura that attach us to an oval-shaped base. And it's this base that fits in right, um, it's of the same shape of the oval window and fits right snugly into this oval window. The head of the stapes has a depression, and that's what is connected to the lenticular process of the incus. And as I said, the base is what's fixed uh, to the oval window, and it's in normal, it's it it gently articulates with the oval window. Uh, one of the significance of this junction of the base of the stapes and um, the oval window is. In some condition, um, in one condition known as autosclerosis, uh, this is where there's a spongy, bony growth. Um, and this condition, autosclerosis, might run in families. And you probably might have heard somebody having to have a middle ear surgery. And typically, it's uh, for this condition where they actually remove this stapes and its abnormal bony growth and put a prosthesis instead of that something that we might touch on when we talk about the disorders of the ear. There's two muscles within the tympanic cavity, namely the tensa tympani and the stapedius. The tympan tensa tympani is the larger of the two. It's still about only about 2.5 centimeter in length. It originates from the interior wall of the middle ear cavity, just above the eustachian tube and it, it attaches itself to the manubrium of the malleus. So whenever we're talking about a muscle, we need to talk about what nerve innervates that muscle. So in the case of the tensor tympani, it's a trigeminal, or the fifth cranial nerve. So when the fifth cranial nerve is um, activated, it actually contracts the tensor tympani muscle. When it does that, it uh, draws the tympanic membrane inwards and thereby increasing the tension of the tympanic membrane. The second middle ear muscle uh, is a stapedius. And it, it, again, it's the smallest muscle in the human body. Uh, 
with a length of about only 7 mm. It originates from the posterior wall, uh, the mastoid wall, and uh, the stapedius muscle is innervated by the facial nerve, which is a seventh cranial nerve. Again, it's important that uh, to note that it's two cranial nerves traversing through the middle ear space, namely the trigeminal and the facial nerve. Both of these nerves have important functions in controlling your facial muscles and taking uh, sensory information from the facial, from the face area. Um, the clinical significance of that is if there is a long-standing middle ear infection, uh, there is a chance that um, it might result in paralyzing these nerves. And hence, one of the things that, as an audiologist, you would notice when you initially, when you're doing this physical examination of the ear, uh, is to can directly assess the intactness of these nerves by asking the face person to smile. Um, and you're looking at the symmetry of the facial muscles. Okay, going back to the stapedius, the stapedius muscle, uh, when it's activated by the seventh cranial nerve or the facial nerve, it pushes the stapes into the oval window. And again, it tenses this ossicular chain. Um, and that plays an important role, uh, actually plays a protective role. The acoustical stapedial reflex um, is when the stapedius muscle is activated. And in this case, it's activated by uh, relatively loud sounds. Okay. Um, if the sound is about more than moderately loud, like 70 to 90 decibels above a one's threshold, um, the stapedius muscle is activated, stiffening the ossicular chain. And what that does is it, it serves as a protective function uh, by reducing the amount of sound entering the inner ear. Uh, and the reduction in sound can be as much as 5 to 10 decibels, especially around frequencies um, at frequencies below but 1.2 kilohertz, so especially reducing those low frequency sounds. Um, and the recent um, understanding is this stapedial reflex um, primarily plays a role in reducing um, one's own voice, the volume of one's own voice, especially for the lower frequencies. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, if there's a clinical condition that affects the stapedial reflex contraction, apparently one's voice would sound more boomy. Uh, in other words, there's going to be more amplitude in the lower frequencies. Um, this stapedial reflex um, does have a protective function. It reduces the amplitude of the sounds uh, um, that are allowed. But it does have a, about 60 to 120 milliseconds delay. Um, so it wouldn't be effective in reducing those impulsive sounds like a loud sudden explosion um, or that from a gunshot. Also, this reflex is sustained only for about two minutes, and after that, uh, it's relaxed. In other words, you lose a protective function. So if you're having long-standing noise, like factory noise, um, then, uh, of course, you need to wear ear protection, um, and the stapedial reflex might not uh, be enough. Nevertheless, the acoustical stapedial reflex uh, is a reflex. It's automatic. Uh, and so in, in audiology, it's used as a, an objective tool to assess um, well, the one's hearing. Uh, it is an important test within the middle ear emittance batteries, something that we're going to be talking about the next lecture, because it's reliable and it's, again, it's objective. In other words, it doesn't require the participation of the patient. So often it's used as a tool to indirectly assess uh, one's hearing levels. Uh, and it, it's very worthwhile doing that uh, for difficult to test populations, like for instance, children, where we want an objective means of assessing their hearing. Again, uh, just to stress, I've got a number of videos. Uh, many of them have YouTube videos that are linked um, to the PowerPoint slides. 
You may not be able to open them from the video lecture, but if you were to open review through the PowerPoint slides, uh, you should be able to link that and they'll take you to uh, different websites and different videos. Some of those videos might be, um, the content might be redundant, but they stress on different aspects uh, relevant to this lecture. So I urge you guys to visit those videos for more information. Okay, so uh, in, earlier I mentioned about some ligaments. There's about five ligaments that actually hold uh, these three ossicles. And those ligaments, uh, as you can see are over here, are the, these are like, there's three ligaments attaching the malleus to the walls of the middle ear space. And um, there's one each for the incus and the stapes. So again, that's those are the ones that are responsible for kind of holding the ossicular chain dangling within this air-filled uh, middle ear space uh, with, with minimum amount of inertia. Okay, going back to the function of the middle ear, the beginning of the previous lecture, we talked about how the main function of the middle ear is to, um, to compensate for this loss of energy when sound travels from an air medium in the external ear um, and when it tries to reach into the inner ear, which is having a fluid medium. So sound, for that matter, any uh, form of energy, when it travels from a less dense medium like air to a more denser medium like uh, a liquid medium, a majority of the energy is being reflected back. So in our case, it actually might be as high as 99.9%. .9%. Uh, and when we convert that into a decibel, a non-linear decibel scale, that accounts to about around 30 dB loss. So the middle ear's main function is to kind of match this impedance so that we don't lose energy uh, when sound travels from the external ear reaching into the inner ear. And it does so by two main mechanisms. One would be the area ratio another would be the lever action. The area ratio refers to the difference in the surface area of the tympanic membrane in relation to the surface area of the oval window. We know that pressure refers to uh, force per unit area. And in an earlier lecture, we talked about there's two different ways of increasing pressure. You can either increase the force or you can decrease the surface area. So in this case, the force remains the same, but the surface area is much reduced when you're moving from this much wider tympanic membrane to the smaller oval window. And in fact, there's about a 14-fold increase in pressure. And when that's converted into decibels, that amounts to about 25 dB increase in the amplitude. Again, this thinking about the analogy of how the needle of a syringe, um, because of it's sharp, it results in more pressure, such as the case over here, when the same force is applied to a smaller area, there's more pressure, um, so increasing the, the loudness by 25 dB. Another way where this impedance mismatch is compensated is by the lever action the sound from the external ear actually converted to mechanical energy by the tympanic membrane because it, it oscillates, it vibrates um, depending upon the pressure and the frequency of the sound. That in turn moves the ossicular chain. As it moves through the ossicular chain, it moves through the longer malleus to the relatively shorter incus. Uh, so the malleus is about 1.3 times uh, longer than that of the incus. And we know based on lever action that if you put a force in a longer arm of the lever that results in more force in the shorter arm of the lever. And in this case it, that increases the intensity or amplitude by two more two more decibels. Thus um, out of the 30 dB that we lose when energy travels from an air to a liquid medium about 27 dB is compensated by this middle ear actions. And it seems that this middle ear actions is more, um, it's greatest for the lower frequencies. 
in other words the lower frequencies the gain is much better um, than than the higher frequencies to, to summarize in the middle here we have three bones the three ossicles two muscles the tensor tympani and the stapedius each of them are innervated by one cranial nerve the tensor tympani is innervated by the uh, trigeminal cranial nerve the fifth cranial nerve while the stapedius is innervated by the seventh or uh, the facial nerve we've got two windows um, we've got the oval window and then the round window uh, the stapes foot plate the end of the stapes uh, is attached to the oval window while uh, the round window's purpose seems to be to dissipate the pressure that's created when the stapes moves in and out of this bony inner ear compartment it's got one opening the eustachian tube and again in in a normal cases normal adults this eustachian tube remains closed uh, but it's only activate it's open when you yawn or you sneeze or um, uh, when you swallow um, and optimally it needs to be closed the eustachian tube needs to be closed uh, to maintain a constant air pressure within the middle ear space um, and that's the reason why when it's open actually uh, those intermittent times um, it actually might reduce the the performance in a way the of this middle ear ossicles or middle ear movement the reason why sound um, the speech sounds muffled or and it's difficult to hear when you're chewing um, or when you're swallowing or yawning again to review the functions of the middle ear uh, the main function is this middle ear transformer action um, where you compensate about 27 db of the 30 db loss in average uh, by the lever action and by the area ratio then we have the acoustical stapedial reflex which is an important physiological uh, reflexive action of the stapedius muscle uh, it seems to have a protective function protecting the the delicate inner ear uh, structures from loud sounds uh, but for us in clinical audiology it also serves as an important objective diagnostic tool because it uh, if you see the reflex in other words if you see if you give a loud sound and if you see uh, a stiffening of the tympanic membrane um, that kind of tells us that um, the, the pathway, this reflex pathway that includes the inner ear, the hearing nerve, um, and the st stapedius muscle is intact. It's another, so it lets us objectively assess all the structures within the middle ear and the inner ear for that matter. Again, something that we're going to be talking about in the following lecture um, when we talk about the middle ear assessment. Um, the eustachian tube. Uh, is a tube that connects the middle ear space. It originates from the interior wall of the middle ear, leading into the nasopharynx. Its purpose is to equalize the pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane, that is the middle ear and the external ear pressure. And that's important uh, to maintain an optimum uh, vibrating surface of the tympanic membrane. And it's in cases, in clinical cases where that's affected, like say for if you have an upper respiratory tract infection uh, when the eustachian tube it's not doing its job that actually results in a negative pressure within the middle ear and that actually might progress into a middle ear infection uh, resulting in uh, a hearing loss that we call as a conductive hearing loss and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about um, uh, pure tone audiometry and conductive hearing loss